Holy moly. Whoa. That's crazy. Pretty neat fish. He's puffing at me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm Eric Baker. You may know me from Tennessee Uncharted, but now I'm expanding my horizons to explore the entire Tennessee Valley. And I'm bringing my friend Ariel Nicole along for the ride. While sometimes we'll journey together, other times not. We hope to take you to places you never knew existed or where you've always dreamed of going. The Tennessee Valley is chock full of fishing and hunting opportunities. So today, we are celebrating the various groups and individuals who work tirelessly to preserve and manage our waters and lands. It's these people that want to pass on the idea of conservation to future generations, so they too can enjoy a rich and biodiverse ecosystem. Located between Lake Barkley and Kentucky Lake, the land between the lakes is an inland peninsula created in the 1960s by the Tennessee Valley Authority. The area's recreational, educational, and economic benefits have made it one of the most visited attractions in Kentucky. Now in the hands of the Forest Service, the area's 170,000 acres of forests and wetlands are home to some rather surprising wildlife, and Eric is getting an exclusive viewing only allowed with an official ranger. This is one of the prettier sights I've seen. I'm glad you like it. It's, uh, you're in our elk and bison prairie here on Land Between the Lakes, and uh, we've got a 650-acre enclosure here that was developed back in 1996. They uh, put this uh, fence up and they brought some elk and bison in, as the name might imply. Why elk and bison? Well, you think of those uh, animals today, you think, oh, they're a Western species. Right. But historically, there was a whole bunch of those things out here. You know, some of the interstates, like Interstate 24 that runs up here, were, were actually originally trails made by huge herds of bison as they migrated as far east as the coast, uh, all the way down as far as Florida. Hmm. And they didn't hook up too well when the settlers came in and found out how huntable and tasty they were. And they uh, whittled down their numbers over time. And by the early to mid 1800s, they were all pretty much wiped out. Are the elk and bison reproducing? I mean, are they, yeah. are they thriving? Yeah, they're thriving as much as we can allow them within a fenced area. When we have excess elk, we try to make them available. So we've given a lot of elk to you know Tennessee. The last bunch went to West Virginia hmm. um, to help start some of their populations. Bringing the native sons and daughters back yes, home, yes. I'll say. Yes, so it's neat to be able to contribute to that. And then those elk are roaming free out in uh, the hills and dales of uh, eastern U.S. So, you know, we just pulled through the gate. What am I going to experience? You've got a three and a half mile loop road that you can drive, and you can drive it as many times as you want once you've come in, and they're free roaming within the, the area. So you're driving among the animals, and they kind of come and go. They've got room to get away from the visitors if they're trailing camera shot that day. Sometimes timing is a bit of it. You may see only elk or only bison. Uh, occasionally you won't see either one, uh, but it's best if you think about how the animals are feeling at the time. So if it's the middle of summer, stick to the early, early morning, late, late evening. They don't want to be out baking in the sun either. They're used to seeing people, but they're not comfortable with them. You know, you can't feed them. They don't come up to the cars and try to beg for food. It's not that kind of thing. Right. And we try to make sure it isn't. What that allows is these animals do survive fine out in the wild once we let them go from here. They're used to eating food that grow here in the eastern U.S. right here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so when we let them go, they know how to get by on their own and get through a winter on their own, you know, without having to go in a barn and eat a pile of hay. One of the things we're trying to do is maintain this habitat. Right. The openings are what really attract the bison. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the elk like a little bit of both. They like the openings and the and the open forests with the browse, they're kind of like deer. They like to eat buds of seedling trees and, and things like that. But uh, it's not just for elk and bison. It uh, helps benefit a, a wide variety of these mixed forest species. A lot of birds and, and rodents and all the things that feed on those. You'll see bald eagles out here and all types of hawks. And you have your own circle of there, life going on There's a whole thing here. going on out here. And <laughs> right? of course, you know, the elk and well, bison is the selling point on, right. on the sign, but it really benefits those a lot more than just that. Right? Go out. Yeah. Right. So what's to be learned 
in these 650 acres. We're trying to remind the public this stuff used to be here. Right. And at the same time, show them the benefits of doing this. Maybe they own a farm. They say, boy, that is pretty neat. I didn't know that if I let my grass grow in this field, I'd have all this extra wildlife. I'd mm -hmm. mow it every year. People have gotten in the habit of mowing, mm -hmm. so it looks like a big uh, park or, or lawn. And, and there's actually benefits to having things rough around the edges. Absolutely. And that just, you know, that's, that's a good thing. What can people do to help? Uh, support what you guys do here. Visit the facilities and help spread the word and you know it's not really supported by tax income so they actually pay a per vehicle fee when they enter okay and uh, that helps us keep the gates open mm. uh, to well, that I, what we can. It's kind of a bucket list thing um, I've been lucky enough to see an elk but I mean just in one instance in my entire life have I seen an elk up close and actually um, heard a bugle and all that I mean that really is a, a unique thing. That is cool right there. The USDA Forest Service works with groups like the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, TVA, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, and more, as it certainly takes a village to preserve and protect these beautiful creatures. You're getting some flowers in your hair, buddy. He's being a pollinator right now. It also takes a village here at the Paris Landing area of Kentucky Lake, where various groups are intent on making sure the aquatic wildlife is happy and healthy. Their eco-health checks make sure this popular fishing spot stays that way. What are we doing out here? This is part of our annual monitoring that we do for our uh, reservoir fish assemblage index. We work on 49 reservoirs throughout the southeast, and uh, we collect all the fish that we can. We'll weigh and measure them and record the information, and then we go to the same sites every time we come out here. So we've been collecting data here for 20 plus years, and by doing so, we can look at the long-term averages, tell how the fish community is uh, reacting to environmental changes, and then we work with other agencies, other state biologists. It helps them make management decisions that they make, and it gives us a good indication as to how the fishery's doing. So this is really important, what you're doing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. We want to have the smallest footprint that we can when it comes to the fisheries. Cool. So we're not hurting the fish, right? No. We use uh, electricity to temporarily stun the fish. Okay. So the way this whole process works, we have a generator back here. Mm -hmm. The generator provides electrical current. It leaves from the generator. It'll travel out these poles and the poles will hang off, the, the rakers will hang off into the water. Okay. So they act as the anode, the bottom of the boat acts as the cathode and it creates an electrical field. So the fish, their muscles tense up and they float to the water surface and uh, then we'll have someone collect the fish in a net. They bring it back here and we weigh and measure the fish. We check it for disease and parasites and then uh, we return it shortly after that. It takes anywhere from a few seconds to a couple minutes before they recover fully. You have to you have your foot on the pedal for electricity to go into the water. Okay. Okay, so this is like a safety switch. So if by chance somebody falls overboard, mm -hmm. then it breaks that that circuit, and so the electricity will turn off. Oh, okay. So go ahead and step on the pedal there. There you go. Look oh. at all of those fish up here. Oh wow. Yeah, that's a bluegill and a warmouth, sunfish. Both of those are in the sunfish family. Ah. Okay. Nice. Flip it over. There you go. It's a forearm workout. Yeah. <laughs> so these are three of the common sunfish species that we get here. So we got a bluegill sunfish, a long ear, and then also a warm mouth. When we're collecting these fish, we want to see multiple year classes of fish represented. So you know you've got a successful spawn and recruitment going on. Let's get us some more here. There's some other ones right here. Here's another one. There you go. There you go. You got it. Yeah, yeah. You've already got it now. You got the depth down. Oh, I missed. It's not quite like flipping pancakes. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> so we enter the abiotic data here on this page, such as the habitat, secondary habitat, water temperature. And then at the end of this, we'll give a time on there. So we quantify this by distance and time. So we get a catch per unit of effort. Help me out here, Greg, with the CPU. Yeah, free. catch per unit effort. Um, so basically the number of fish in like a certain distance of shoreline. Mm -hmm. So if we got 
say 50 fish in that little section over here, mm -hmm. and then we got 50 fish from here all the way to there, you would know there's a different density of fish in a certain area. Mm -hmm. So there's a high density in this area and, and a, a smaller, a smaller density, density yeah. in that. Okay. So that's how we can standardize. So you guys normally just like tag team it together? Like you'll go out together and um, do it? Or? Yeah, we have a crew of four okay. that'll go out. So this this is like a production line when we're actually sampling because oh, okay. we're out here eight, nine hours a day. So they're pretty What kind neat. of fish is that? This sucker? is a spotted sucker. Can they live on it? the bottom. Yeah. Oh, okay. They live on the bottom. Their mouth is very turned down like that. So oh, that kind of wow. tells you where they live in the reservoir. Mm -hmm. And when we put him in the water, he'll color up a little bit more and those, mm -hmm. those spots will become a little more evident. Okay, um, so what we'll do, I'll let you enter these fish okay. on this and I will, I'll do the weighing and measuring. Right now we're on largemouth bass. So I just click on that? Mm-hmm. So it is uh, 244. So just hit 244 and then okay. hit record. Whoa. Yeah. I caught that? Yeah, you did. Did I really? Yeah. No, I didn't. Yeah, I promise you dipped that earlier. <laughs> yeah. I dipped that? Yeah, well, uh, this first, first one. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I saved him for you. So he is 491. Length 491. Uh-huh. I'm going to go ahead and put this guy back now. OK. Pretty cool, huh? That was cool. When I go home and tell them what I did, how can I like break it down in layman's terms? The important message is you can tell a lot about what's going on based on how the fish community react. That's awesome. If somebody wanted to get into this, how do they go about doing that? There's a lot of different agencies and, and organizations that, that do the same kind of work that we do. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of opportunities to volunteer. That's so cool. I love it. Do what you love and love what you do, right? Yeah, it's pretty rewarding. We get to do a lot of outreach. We get to work in the rain. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I want to go again. I want to catch more fish. Yeah, I want. I want, to, I want to collect more fish. There you <laughs> yeah. Go, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Holy moly! Whoa! Oh wow! That's a uh, big mouth buffalo. <laughs> That's crazy. Pretty neat fish. That's big. So when you get this, you're you're part of the big river gang. Look at him. He's puffing at me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so put your hand underneath it there, and then grab it here on the tail. Don't drop it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now look at now look at your gloves. Oh. <laughs> good to know that people are watching over our natural resources. Now I'm off to try my hand at hunting on some private hunting grounds in southeastern Kentucky. Scott Cronin, an avid hunter and my guide, is putting me through a little rifle and crossbow 101 before we do the real thing. Ariel, we're going to okay. go through a 20-gauge shotgun with you today okay. on the range All right. so that you can get yourself acquainted with shooting the shotgun and hopefully, hopefully, harvesting game one day with All it. Right. Okay, so I'm gonna get you to sit down, if sure. you don't mind. And with a firearm, there's a few things that you always need to remember. And that is that you always wanna treat a firearm like it is loaded. And uh, you wanna take and make sure that the muzzle, which is the end of the barrel, is always pointing in a safe direction. So okay. we're gonna be shooting at a target just right at 20 yards. Your safety will operate off of this button here, off of the trigger housing, and you'll actually push it over and when that is over, that mm -hmm. makes the trigger live where the gun can fire. And so okay. for today on the range, we're just going to load one at a time. So I'm going to get you to put your hearing protection on. Okay. And when you shoulder the gun, you will come into your shoulder and you will put your cheek down onto the gun and you will see two beads. You'll see this bead and your green bead. And what you'll want to do is where the red is at on the turkey's neck, where the feathers and the skin come together, that's where you want to put your bead and then you'll pull the trigger. So we'll start off and, and let you try this first round. And then we'll try it again. Okay. So I'll help you on this first one. This is the button that will actually close the receiver. So now you have one in the magazine. Okay. So we'll put this into your shoulder and go ahead and prop your knee to where you can actually help balance the firearm. Okay. You're good. So I'm going to be like this. You want to put that. Good. So you'll put your cheek down onto the weapon. So I'm going to put my ears on, take your finger and push the safety over, go ahead and push, okay. Now the gun will be ready to fire, so you can go ahead and put your finger on the trigger and when you get your beads lined up, you can pull the trigger. 
Okay. I got missed. No, you shot this a little hot. Go ahead ah. and take your finger off the trigger. Okay, put your safety back on. All right, let's go down and look and see what you did. So it looks like we shot this up a little bit high. We're gonna put a new target up. Okay. And we're gonna aim for right here where the wattles and the skin come okay. together. Let's try it again. So were you scared, nervous? I was trying to line it up, but it kept moving. And okay. then finally I was like, I think you just need to shoot it. Okay. <laughs> All right, so go ahead and raise this net as high as you can. Keep your shoulders back into the chair in your back, kind of lean back in there. Now use your knee to help rest your gun if you can do like, so. Yeah, off of your arm. And take your safety off. I'll go ahead and shoot. Awesome. You did good. Better. Because now you're, you're <laughs> yeah, now you're down on the target. You just got a little bit of a pull to the left, but you would have harvested that bird. Yeah, yeah. Go see my damage. You got it. <laughs> the damage is good. I would be proud of that one. <laughs> So what do you think? You like it? Not like yeah. it? No, it's Surprises cool. Yeah, you? yeah, it's cool. But there's a, a lot that like goes into it with like form and technique it's, it's and, all about, it's and all a lot about of concentration. Your, your cheek weld is the most important thing. Okay. And so once you get that and we'll get your eyes trained to look down that bead, yeah. you'll be hitting the bullseye every time. I'm going to try another device for you. We're actually going to have you shoot from your knees. Is it generally like better to shoot with use a field pod? It kind of holds the weight of the gun so that you can focus on your form. I'll leave this loose where you can go left and right and you can go up and down. See which one you like better. Okay. This should be the steadiest it's felt yet. Yeah. I'm gonna put you a shell in. I'm gonna close it. Take the safety off. Okay. And you'll wanna gently pull the trigger anytime you're ready. There you go. And you just smoked the turkey. Nice. Awesome. You did it. Nice. That's it. <laughs> I mean, that's perfect. That's as good as it gets. Stand up and look at your target from here. So, see where you're at? Yeah. I think you've mastered the shotgun. Now we need to move to a crossbow. Okay. I mean, that's like, take it off, take it home, be proud of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. You see that? Got him. Good deal. Cool. Now, we're gonna change targets on you a little bit. Okay. Let's move this. We'll try oh. your luck on a crossbow. Okay, yeah, put your deer target up there. Let's just say, for example, that, that you're gonna go on a deer hunt, okay? Mm -hmm. Whenever you try to use archery equipment or a mm -hmm. farm to harvest a, a deer, then what you're wanting to look at is naturally you're gonna have the shoulder mm -hmm. and then you're gonna have the abdominal section of the deer. And, and mm -hmm. what we always try to do is we try to come straight up the leg mm -hmm. and we try to go just directly behind the shoulder. So we're going for- but this is my goal, like uh -huh. this Your area. goal is any of this area right here. <clears throat> All right, we'll cock it and we'll let you try to shoot it and see how you do. So you'll come down and I'll pull up, okay? And so now my crossbow is cocked. Remember, you have all the time in the world, okay? Right. You're in no rush for anything. So go ahead and get down onto the crossbow. Remember to think about your head placement and your cheek placement. We'll load your boat. Your vein will go down on top of the rail through this channel, and then you'll make sure that it's pushed all the way back. Okay, so you'll come up here, push the green fletching down, okay? Make sure it comes all, right. all the way back. Yeah, all the way back. All right, now go ahead and get on your weapon. I'm gonna take your safety off. Okay. Go ahead and put your finger on the trigger. It's right behind the shoulder. Center of the deer up and down. Awesome. And you just shot a deer nice. if that was a deer. <laughs> Let's go check it out. Okay. <laughs> so I'm proud of you. You like that one, don't you? I do, yeah. So, that's perfection on shot one. I'll let you go ahead and pull it out. Okay. It's gonna take a little bit of effort. Pull, pull, pull. I think I need help. It's like the sword in the stone, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Thanks. I would have to call you to come so, help me pull it so out. So it's, it's all good. Let's try your crossbow again. Let's let you cock it, okay? Okay. <laughs> so it's a really simple process. Go ahead and put your foot through the front. Okay. It doesn't matter, your left or your right. And we're gonna take these hooks and then we're gonna come back towards us. Okay. And remember, one continuous pull, do not ever let it go. Just okay. pull, 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 pull till you hear it click good. Keep on pulling, there you go. Okay. You're a pro. Getting my workout in. That's right. <laughs> go ahead and put your crossbow up there. 
okay? Okay. So go ahead and get settled. And then you can take the safety off when you're ready to shoot. You get really steady. You want to easily bring your finger to the trigger. You really want to just, you, you want it to be a surprise when that crossbow goes off. There you go. Smoked it. Nice. See? Practice. That was fun. <laughs> awesome. I think you're ready to go and try your luck at maybe hunting a white-tailed deer. All right, all right. You're going with me, right? Yeah. I'm okay, with all right. <laughs> so uh, I think I did pretty good. Pretty sure he would give me an A if we were in class. I think I would pass with flying colors, maybe, maybe even high honors. Definitely on the crossbow. Um, that's probably my favorite. From what we just, like the couple hours that we spent like shooting, I really enjoyed working with the crossbow. I felt like I could have got right into one of those like zombie shows and just like took somebody out. A pretty successful crash course, if I must say so myself. But the time has come for the true test. One thing's for sure, you have to be able to sit still and be quiet for long stretches. Grandpa's gonna be so proud of me. I'm so happy for you. Thank you. you ready to go up here and see if you got your yeah. deer? Yeah, I'll follow you. <laughs> you see I your knot? Yeah, it's a lighted knot. Okay. It allows you to see exactly where your arrow's at. Go ahead and pull that out of the ground. Okay, let's look at it here and you can tell what you see all over that shaft. Blood. That's right. So that's a that's a really good sign. We had a complete pass through, and then we've got blood all the way through, and it looks like you've got a perfect heart shot. So um, if that's the case, your deer will probably be within the next 50 to 75 yards. So okay. So we're gonna track her. We were right? track your deer. Yeah. And we're looking for like blood or more. Yeah, hair. blood or hair. You got blood or hair? There's yeah. blood right here. Mm -hmm. Right. Here's hair right here. See this? So that's that's a good sign. So let's okay. keep going this direction. Okay. And there's more blood over there. This one? Okay. Right there. All right. That's my deer. So I think I did get it through. Did I go through the heart? Yes, ma'am. Smoked it. Show us where you got it at. So, right there she is. So this is my first time deer hunting ever in my life. Uh, we came out here today, we sat in the blind for like yeah. three hours yeah, maybe? Yeah, like, three, like, three hours. And I would say like the last 10 minutes we That's saw right. two deer and they were just kind of eating. And then um, I got a good look at her and trusted what you said. and. Uh, shot it. Yeah, let it Took rip. Took her out, yeah. So, pretty good results. <laughs> yeah. So, 
I'm really happy for you. So Thank you. We'll she's get her, big. Yeah, bigger she than what is. I thought she was. Yeah, well, she's a <laughs> she's a full size of mature doe, and uh, we'll get her cleaned up and and thank the landowner and okay. hopefully provide some meals to some fortunate people. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Celebrate your harvest. So. Okay. Awesome job. Thanks. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> full disclosure: I had a plane to catch, so Scott harvested and cooked the deer after I left. Be sure to check out our website for that video short. I've learned a lot on these excursions, and I've learned that you can do a little or a lot to balance recreation with conservation. While some become biologists or agricultural educators, some volunteer with fish and wildlife management groups, or simply leave no trace where they recreate. You can start small, buy wildlife stamps, reduce your disposable plastics that so often end up in our waterways killing fish. Take that first small step because you can make a difference and every little effort will make the world richer in the long run. Whoa! That's a uh, big mouth buffalo. Don't drop oh. him. Ooh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> now, look at, now look at your gloves. Oh. <laughs>